Hi, I'm Stephen Hand from Archery Supplies. Today we're here to look at the new bow from Oneida for 2017. It's called the <laughs> it's called the Oneida Phoenix. Um, now Oneida's had a long history of lever action bows, so a lot of you probably don't know what a Oneida is. Now a normal compound bow, you fit a cam to the end and you use the cam system to pull down on the limb. This is called a lever action bow. So it's using this curve thing, actually it doesn't move, it's not like a recurve limb, this is fixed. It uses a lever to pull down on this bit here. Now this is the limb, this is dead straight, so you're actually using a lever. So to lift things you can use a block, block and tackle, which is what a normal bow is, or you can use a lever. This is a lever. It pivots on this point here and you're basically pulling up you're using this cam system here to pull down on this on this short limb now the Oneida brand has been around for a number of years I was the distributor for Oneida back when I was about 22 um, so that was 25 years ago back then they were a cast riser today they're a machine riser you've got machined limb pocket the cam system has changed since the first Oneida Aero Forces into this twin cam system here. But the bow itself is almost identical to the bow you saw back in the 1990s. You have the same shaped cams. You have a timing system here which is actually a metal, it's a metal circle. In the old Oneida Aero Forces this was plastic. Um, so you have that down here. Now the cable actually runs down the handle down here and the purpose of that is you have a cam system at the top and a cam system at the bottom. Now you need those to be in time. So this round thing here is a cable which connects the bottom system to make sure these cams are in time. Now how do you know these cams are in time? You can, the way which I used to do it, I take off the grip here and I check the tension on both of the cables here to make sure they're identical. Now they will be identical, but you've got to measure the distance from there to there, top and bottom, to make sure it's the same. Now if it's not the same, there to there, let me get this right, you've got a timing screw just there in orange, you loosen that off if, if the tension's not the same, and you do something, there's a screw. Sorry, it's been like 20 years since I've worked on these. Um, you do something, I can't remember what I do now. Um, to time them and you lock it back in place. Basically there. I think it's just the power of the bow. I think you just wind up and down the limbs. Um, there is, a, there is a little screw there, uh, like a normal screwdriver, and it's got a little locking screw just under there. Now with that, you can adjust the tension on the cables. Just using a screwdriver, you loosen off the screw and, and adjust the cables to make sure they're in time. But basically this is a pretty simple bow to work on. You have four modules, each wheel has a little module in it. Just there's the screw, you loosen it off and inside here there's a little module. Now the bow comes with a whole series of modules to adjust both let off and draw length and you basically snap them off you give them a little bit of sandpaper and I'll show you how they all work um, and you fit whatever size draw length you need and whatever size let off you want. Now the bow comes in two draw lengths may even come in three it comes in a long, a medium and a short this one here is the long. It goes from 28, I think, to about 31, but I could be wrong on that, and I'll check the specs. Now, just on that, I'm hoping you can read there, it says the draw length goes from 28 to 23.5. That's clearly a typo. And with bow manufacturers, I'm going to say bow manufacturers, this is a relatively new company. It got, originally when I went over to the Oneida factory, I was having problems with supply from Anita back when I was 22, it was my first trip to America and I flew in and I went to this place called Phoenix and I'm going to get the wrong area wrong but it's on the east coast of America down from New York it's a little country town they had a big big factory 
big factory, a small factory compared to PSE, but it's a relatively small factory. There was probably 20 people working there building these bows. Um, and I was having problems with getting supply, so I went there and saw them. They fixed me up straight away and gave me a custom target bow to shoot. Now, since that time, a NIDA has changed the outboard limb from a wood limb, so it was a wood laminate limb, and once again, this limb doesn't move, to a like a glass fiberglass limb. It's a bit, it's hollow in the inside. Now, we used to quieten these bows down by fitting um, dampening things to the inside here, like a rubber ab absorption thing, and we used to fit silencers and brush deflectors to the inside to quieten them down. These were a really popular bow for me back in the 1990s. I used to sell about two a week, and this bow for me outsold all my other bows. Back in 1990 and 1990s, this, the Oneida Force used to sell for 800. The Oneida Phoenix sells for around $2,000. Um, that's Australian dollars. So, what has changed since 1990? They've now got the string stops system on it. You've got a system here to absorb the vibration on these cables. You've changed the um, timing system from plastic to metal. They've also changed the draw stops. Now, I can't really remember how the draw stops worked on the old one. I know they bolted onto the outside of the cam and as you pulled it back I think it might have touched the inside of the cable. No it didn't. There was a bracket here. There was a bracket on the old Aeroforce which bolted to the riser and the draw stop came and hit the bracket. Now this is actually built into the riser in the new models and the draw stop is just there. Top and bottom. And all you do to adjust it is you move it backwards and forwards. Really, really simple. Now I got in, I think I got eight of these bows from Anida. I got in all the colors. It comes in camo, black, green, which is an olive drab green, and a blue, I'm gonna call it blue camo. Um, now, on one of my bows, it didn't come with the draw stops, the, Olive drab one had a slight scratch in the riser. So, you know, take from that what you will. Um, I'm gonna say basically probably the checking process is not as robust as a big bow manufacturer. Like with PSE, and I'm always gonna flare back to PSE because I'm familiar with the factory. The bow goes through about three or four checks before it hits the box it's sent in. So you have a person pull all the parts to build the bow, you have a person who builds the bow, you have a person who checks that, you have a person who then checks the poundage to make sure it's right, and the last person checks the timing to make sure it's okay. Now, my gut feeling is it's a smaller company, it's newly been set up, when I say newly been set up, so the original Oneida company was sold to Claude Pollington, who was the biggest Anida dealer in America. I was second biggest in the world at the time. He brought it. Now, his son, his son ran the company, and I don't know how successful they were. I know I couldn't get any parts from them. I know when I went to the ATA shows, I could never meet with the guy, because uh, he was always too busy doing whatever he was doing. Um, and basically, it was almost impossible to get a bow out of them. Now the company was just sold in 2016 and I believe it was sold to the son of the guy who owns Bass Pro as a bow fishing bow. So he set this bow up as being a bow fishing bow. Now you're probably going to wonder why is this bow a bow fishing bow. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin the cameras around so you can see the ocean and I've got the sunglasses on. Okay, so why is the Oneida a bow fishing bow compared to a normal compound bow? With bow fishing, you generally want to shoot with your fingers. Now with a normal compound bow, that's almost impossible. And I say almost impossible, if you twist your hand a little bit, you talk the bow a little bit, you're gonna derail the bow. Now how many derails do you see in an archery shop a week? I used to see almost two a week, I'm down to probably one a fortnight. 
So it just requires a small bit of torque and you're going to run the, cam the string straight off the cams and blow up the bow. With the lever system, it doesn't matter what you do to the bow, you cannot pull the string off the limb tip because it's just like a recurved bow. So for finger shooting a compound bow, this is perfect because when you pull it back, you can't, it doesn't matter what you do, how much torque you apply to this bow, you cannot pull the strings off the limb. I'm going to say it's impossible. So for a person who wants to shoot with fingers, and that's where bow fishing comes into it, because a lot of people who bow fish want to shoot with fingers, this bow is really, really cool. Now if you want to hunt with fingers, this bow is really, really cool. This bow is used on the Arrow TV series. You'll see the top, the, the green arrow shooting this bow with his fingers. Now you might say, why did they pick this bow to shoot with fingers on the show? One, there's, there's some PSC Chaos has been used by the ladies on that show with very, very low poundage. I think they're shooting about two to three pounds to pull back the bow. But even with two or three pounds, you run the risk of basically pulling the strings and cables off the cam system, especially on a low poundage. Because on a low poundage, all it takes is a slight bit of torque left to right and you're going to pull it off where the actor who plays the Green Arrow has actually been trained to shoot and I think this bow kind of looks cool especially for the movie set but if you're going to hunt with this back in the 1990s I had lots and lots of people hunting with anitas with fingers up close and even from distance people were spot on accurate with this bow now I myself shot Target with one of these bows um, now my scores with Target compared to a normal compound bow I'm going to say we're pretty similar. I couldn't pick the difference. I know I shot the bow for a number of years. Um, now the problem I had back in 1990 with the Anida was the grip was very bulky. It was a cast riser and it was a very, very bulky grip. In the new 2017 version, it's a machine riser. The distance from there to there is much, much thinner. Not as thin as a normal bow, like a Hoyt, it may not even be as narrow as a PSE because the PSEs have the wider grips in 2017, a lot of them do. But it's a fairly comfortable grip. So for me, I think the weight has dropped of this bow, so I think the bow is physically lighter than it used to be. I think it's better built than it used to be. Um, they've got this little machine thing up here. It's pretty cool. So the question is now, what does this bow shoot like compared to the bows of the 1990s? Now, my first thing when I posted I'm going to get these bows in stock in the store, people, I got so many hits on these bows. I mean, everyone was, everyone was excited to see a Niders. I think a lot of people remembered these bows back to when they first used to shoot one and they either wanted one again or they're remembering back to what it was like to shoot one. So people are saying to me, well, what does this shoot like? What's the speed of it? How does it compare? Now, the draw cycle on a NIDA, I'm going to do this with my fingers, it's a very, very easy bow to draw. So just drawing it back, it's, it starts getting a valley there, and now I'm getting into this position. It's a very easy bow, so I'm not going to predict, I'm going to predict this is going to be the slowest of all bows I've ever shot. Now back when I used to sell these, people used to say they're really powerful and they shoot a very heavy arrow very fast, unlike a normal compound. I don't know about that, what we're going to do is we're going to put it through a normal speed, speed test, I'm going to shoot the bow at 18 meters and I'm also going to go back to 50 meters and shoot this thing and see how well I group with it. Now I really really like the Anitas. I wouldn't have got back into them um, if I didn't like them. I think they're unique and I think they've got a coolness factor. Um, so but I don't expect the speeds out of it. I expect the bow to be significantly noisier than a normal compound bow um, even with all this su su suppressor system over the bow. It's very hard to get away from the limb slap on the limb here and that overall noise that you used to get from the Uniters, but it was a still a cool bow to shoot. So 
I'm going to take this now and we're going to go and shoot it through a chronograph shoot it at home at 18 meters this is this is the beach which I just want to take you to, to give you a different thing South Australia has great beaches um, this obviously is not a beach where people swim I've moved away from that to film this um, this is a rock beach with big cliffs to the side of me but it's spectacular um, and the oceans are just great um, and there's always people just out here I'm just going to spin around sorry for getting blinded there's always boats out here fishing um, so it's a really really pretty spot so let's go and take this bow now and shoot some arrows with it and see what sort of speeds we get see how it feels to shoot as far as vibration and drawing and um, and I'll probably shoot some with fingers and see how I shoot with it with fingers. So thank you. Okay, so we're here to test the Nida Phoenix at 18 meters to see how well it groups or how well I group with it um, at 18 meters. Now I just want to talk a quick bit about a bit of the history of the Nida company. When it got taken over by the first um, family who brought it the guy was actually a computer guy he wrote computer software and I think it was for a security system made made a lot of money out of that and brought a NIDA as a company for his when I say for his son they wanted a family company to run because they like the idea of manufacturing in America now the son actually invented a bow a lever action bow without cams now it turned out to be not successful um, and I did draw it when I was at one of the ATA shows and it wasn't as smooth as this bow to draw and the price tag was a little bit more and it was a little bit more expensive and there was no cams so I was just using the lever system to pull down on this um, on the limb very similar design without the cams but it turned out to not be as successful as only in production for about two years um, now how do you change the string on this bow you pull the bow back and you have two bits of wood or the Oneida bow press and you put the bow into the because as you draw this these limbs will fold down you put the bow into the press and you can change the string it's very very simple um, I was going to say something else about the Oneida company but anyway let's have a shot now the balance of this bow it leans backwards so it, it performs well with the stabilizer so let's have a shot with it now the bow is very easy to draw um, and you can shoot with fingers or with a release aid. Oh, how are you going to fit a peep sight to this bow? Um, you split the string, using a rubber you'd probably connect it to this, um, to the bar up the top. Um, I couldn't see any other way which you could have put a self-aligning peep on the bow. Some people used to f use the shores of peep which angle. Um, so we're just going to shoot a few shots at 18 meters and see where they go and you can hear the bow being shot now with this bow I would feel better with a longer draw length in the module um, because it's got such a long valley um, but I'm not going to fit a new module to it because I'm just testing um, the bow makes quite a bit of noise when you shoot it um, I'm gonna say it's the noisiest of all bows but it feels like a like a high-powered gun going off um, but what it does it aims really really well so when you aim at the center it just sits there your pin just sits on the middle normally your pin floats around the gold with this it just sits there in the middle um, I don't know if it's got something to do with the cam system. The other thing you'll notice with this bow is when you shoot, if you put the string up with the center of the arrow and try and do it so you can see on the camera, the pins are in dead in line. Now normally the pins are out, out off to the left. This it's dead in line. Now, I find that really interesting with a recurve, when you shoot a recurve, always to the left of the arrow, the pin is. But with this bow it's dead center now some bows I've shot are dead center and some bows are not so the Condor with the Vega system dead center but then the new bow which they are they produce with the cable system which was sorry the Martin Condor 
with the Vega system dead center, but then they produce the Hellfire with a yoke system, not dead center, way out to the left. So to me, that's kind of interesting. I don't, you know, there's all reasons why it's why it occurs, but yeah, this one dead center. Now the sights aren't perfect and that's pretty normal in all my reviews. I've generally had a few siders to test it to get a to get a hitting. I'm more interested in the group, see what the group's like down the other end. bow fills with a shock mechanism there's ver this my D loops turning there's very little shock in the bow although it makes noise there's virtually no shock and that's because the two limbs are the moving in the opposite directions counteract the the vibration there's not actually really nothing moving forward Now to shoet this bow, a knight of people, when I say knight of people, people have shot a knight in the past, they all love them. And it's not surprising to me that people come in my shop and say, show me the 2017 bow, I used to shoot an old one. Um, because they remember it fondly, it's not like you're remembering a bow from the 1990s fondly, because the new bows are so much better. But the Oneida's got a feel, it's got a... It's got a uniqueness about it. It's like a, I'm going to say it's like a hot rod car compared to a new modern car. The new modern cars, I'm going to say, is sleeker, nicer. This is just a nice bit of machinery. Just feels really nice to shoot. Um, the bow's a little bit weighty in the hand. I mean, I don't think the bow's as heavy as some bows on the market. I don't think these things, from what I recall of shooting a NIDA, I don't think these things are actually absorbing a lot of shock or noise. I mean, the concept is good, but it it's very much what I remember of shooting an Ida. The grips are a lot narrower, it feels easy to shoot, it feels nicer, but it feels very similar to the old Ida. almost feel like earmuffs to shoot this thing so but it is cool like you shoot it you know you're shooting a, and it feels so powerful not in the actual draw cycle actually in the shot it's like whoa <laughs> that's an impressive bow I'll shoot one more. Now from here down to there, the arrows look really tight. So this is going to be kind of interesting for me. This is the first time I shot it. And I do like the Oneida. It's honestly it's one of my favorite bows of all time. And I've been trying to get the second hand, trying to buy some second hand ones, but they've been really, really expensive. You know, like a thousand dollars for a bow, 20 years old. It's like 
Now my target bow, which was made, when I say for me, was given to me. It was a custom, because back in the day, a knight used to do custom bows for people. So you'd say, I want this custom finish, and it was spray painted up in a spray booth. It was glossy. This thing was green with silver, silver and green stripes. It was made for someone, and they got a paint chip, so they gave it to me. Anyway, it's sitting in my shop, and um, I work in the public service. And I come back from the shop and I've sold it. So the people who were, who were running my shop had sold my bow on me. Now I don't know what they sold it for and I actually don't know if I got any money for it because at the time they were stealing. Um, but I've seen my bow since being shot around the place. Um, and it was a green, like bright green metallic and bright green silver and the guys put honey and stuff on it and it's, he's wrecked it a bit. I don't know who he is, I've just seen it being shot at a club. But to me that was very, very disappointing. So I did buy an MR80, which was the machine riser version, in anodized red, and the anodizing was very poor. So that was a bit sad for me to get rid of my custom green one. I mean, I've only been given, so I've run an archery shop, well, we've had an archery shop for 32 years. And I've only ever been given the Oneida, which was basically second hand, a Matthews Chill from Matthews. And Win and Win just gave me a bow to test. Um, it's the Adam X, and I'm going to be testing it very soon. So they said, have this and do a bow review on it. The three bows I've only ever been given in my entire lifetime. So, so I was a bit. And that's life that people sell stuff on you in your shop. I had it in there because I thought it looked cool. Yeah, and they sold it. But <laughs> all right, let's go down. The mozzies are coming out. Um, let's go down and see how the group is. Okay, so I'm up here at the target. I just shot 80 meters, and this is literally my first time shooting the Oneida. Now, that's my group. Now, my test normally is, can I fit my fingers around these arrows? And I can. Now, of bows I've ever tested at 18 meters, how many do I get my fingers around? Very, very few. Now, let's look at this group. Now, one thing, the arrows are penetrating more than other bows. Um, this is a 60 pound bow. I have a block, and I have another target behind it. These arrows are going up almost to the fletches, so a lot of penetration. Now with the Oneidas of, of the 1990s, hunters used to say they got heaps of penetration with heavy arrows, and it made it a favorite of hunters. In fact, I had a person up in um, Darwin, Michael Barrett, who used to shoot a Oneida, loves Oneidas, hasn't been able to get one. I know he's shooting a normal compound now, and probably when he sees these are in back in stock, he'll get one, because he was a huge fan. And he shot many Australian records with an Oneida. And I'm talking bow hunting. I'm talking big pigs, big buffalo and that sort of stuff. He literally had most of the records in Australia with an Oneida and shooting basic hunting heads. Now Michael would say to me, I'm not the greatest shot. Most of my shots are done at about 7 metres to the animal. But Michael could actually shoot. At 50 metres, he was a good shot. But he'd always say, all my shots are done really close to the animal. And he said, what I liked about the Oneida, hit really hard. And he'd shoot very heavy arrows. Um, but anyway, this is the group. Now, this is with a five pin sight, whisker biscuit arrow rest, 
no peep sight, basic release aid, and these are pretty good arrows, right? Left and right, pretty good, like that'll be basically X's left and right. Up and down, I'm getting a slight, a slight movement. Now, there's probably a nine there if that sight was centered, but most of those would be tens. So I shot one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight arrows, two, one, two, three there, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight arrows. It's, it's a very, very tight group. Um, now, there's a little bit of up and down movement. Now, part of the reason for that is this has a draw stop on it. Now, I'm not hitting the draw stop because I found the draw stop I set a little bit long for me in some of those shots, I didn't hit the draw stop. Now, hitting the draw stop would bring this in, the height-wise adjustment. Now, I shot target with a NIDA previously and I shot extremely well with it. Um, the bow was too heavy for me and I found the grip too wide. The grip's pretty good on this. Um, the weight's pretty good. I found my pin just sat on the center. So it's not a surprise to me that this is one of the best grips I've ever shot with a hunting bow on any of my reviews because it draws back smooth. So my pin's on the center straight away and it just sat on the center. It didn't wobble around the place. So overall, it makes a bit of a noise. So I think that would require a bit of playing around with stuff um, on the Uniter. Now with the Uniter of years gone by, back in the 1990s, and I can't talk about this one because I haven't played around with it. But back in the days gone by, we, we use puffs on the string, which are woolen puffs. We place them around here. We use brush deflectors there. We put felt down on the inside of the limb there. Now I think off memory, what we also shot was a Dacron string, which was pretty interesting. We'd reinforced the limb tips and I think we found the Dacron string quieter in, in noise. Um, I know we got them a lot quieter than they got them out of the factory. We did put silences on here. I don't think this was ever the no ever the area where noise was created from the Uniter. I always thought it was this string whacking on this. Um, they've got little bumps now on the limbs um but as a bow like now as a bow fishing bow a nighter are pushing these as a bow fishing bow awesome bow fishing bow price price point obviously too high for bow fishing unless you've got money but if you want the ultimate bow fishing bow now if you're shooting big bow fish bow fish if you're bow fishing for big fish and they do in the us this is cool and this would be my first pick for a bow fishing bow in fact this would be the only bow I'd select for bow fishing because this is the coolest, hardest hitting, the fingers, it's it's the only bow. Um, now, there are other bows for, for finger fish shooting. Hoyt produced the Tribute, uh, Tribute I think it's called, um, look it up. It's got round wheels, very old technology, <sighs> like a pretty boring bow. This is cool. This is a cool bow to shoot. And in 10 years, this is still going to be a cool bow. Um, and you're still going to be happy you brought it in 10 years time. So even though it's $2,000, now price point, this is expensive compared to other compound bows. Um, you know, the PSE Carbon Air, $2,000. The top of the range, top of the range Hoyts are $2,000. Now back in 1990s, this bow used to sell for $800. Now the house down the street from me sold for $50,000 in 1990. Today the house would be worth $450,000, so nine times the price. So if I brought the house back in 1990, the house is nine times the price. So that puts the Oneida nine times eight, $7,200. In real terms, that's how cheap this bow is. Because what's happened is housing prices have gone through the roof Wages have gone through the roof. Um, I mean, my wage in, in 1990, when I was a public servant, was 20,000, 22, 23,000. When I left the public service, my wage was 125, and today it would be about $170,000. If I was in private enterprise, my wage would be about $300,000. Um, and you're going to ask me, what's my degree? My degree is computer science. I'm, I'm a computer science person who did hospitals for a lot of years. That's basically what I'd be worth, what I should be worth on the market. 
um, but it's been quite a few years since I've been in the private enterprise or in the public service because I've been running the archery shop. But that's what wages are today. So in real terms, even though this bow is $2,000, in real terms, in real terms, as far as I'm concerned, this is really cheap. Um, back in the 1990s, I used to earn $20 a week working at Woolworths. So the bow was $800. It used to take me basically a long time, almost a year, to pay off a bow, um, to buy a bow. Today, if you worked in my archery shop for, a, and you're casual, you'd buy this bow in two weeks. Um, two weeks work. I couldn't build this bow in two weeks. Um, so to me, even though it's 2,000 people go, oh, that's expensive, not in real terms. Not in real terms compared to cost of housing and compared to wages. Um, yes, there's cheaper bows on the market. The PSC Stinger is 500, but this is not a PSC Stinger. This is a machine riser bow and it's unique. And this bow is more expensive to make than a normal compound bow with this system. So yeah, overall, so the rest of this test, what I want to do is I want to shoot this bow at 50 meters um, and see what the grouping's like. I want to shoot it with fingers and see how well I shoot with it with fingers, see how much finger pinch I get. Um, and I want to put it through a chronograph. It was actually too dark today to put it through a chronograph. The chronograph wouldn't work because the light conditions are too low. So that's where we're up to. So I'm going to do this two-part, three-part review. Um, I really like the bow and I'm going to show you the deal. I'm up here at the target. I just shot 18 meters and this is literally my first time shooting the Oneida. Now that's my group. Now my test normally is can I fit my fingers around these arrows and I can. You know, of bows I've ever tested at 18 meters, how many do I get my fingers around? Very, very few. Now let's look at this group. Now one thing, the arrows are penetrating more than other bows. Um, this is a 60 pound bow. I have a block and I have another target behind it. These arrows are going up almost to the fletches. So a lot of penetration. Now with the Oneidas of of the 1990s hunters used to say they got heaps of penetration with heavy arrows and it made it a favorite of hunters in fact i had a person up in um darwin michael barrett who used to shoot a nighter loves a nighters hasn't been able to get one i know he's shooting a normal compound now and probably when he sees these are in back in stock he'll get one because he was a huge fan and he shot many australian records with a nighter and I'm talking bow hunting. I'm talking big pigs, big buffalo and that sort of stuff. He literally had most of the records in Australia with a nighter and shooting basic hunting heads. Now Michael would say to me, I'm not the greatest shot. Most of my shots are done at about seven meters to the animal. But Michael could actually shoot at 50 meters, he was a good shot. But he'd always say, all my shots are done really close to the animal. And he said, what I liked about the nighter, hit really hard. And he'd shoot very heavy arrows um, but anyway, this is the group. Now, this is with a five pin sight, whisker biscuit arrow rest, no peep sight, basic release aid, and these are pretty good arrows, right? Left and right, pretty good, like that'll be basically X's left and right. Up and down, I'm getting a slight, a slight movement. Now, there's probably a nine there if that sight was centered, but most of those would be tens. So I shot one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight arrows. Two, one, two, three there. Four, five, six, seven, eight, eight arrows. It's, it's a very, very tight group. Um, now there's a little bit of up and down movement. Now part of the reason for that is this has a draw stop on it. Now I'm not hitting the draw stop because I found the draw stop I set a little bit long for me and some of those shots I didn't hit the draw stop. Now hitting the draw stop would bring this in the height wise adjustment. Now I shot target with a nighter previously and I shot extremely well with it. Um, the bow was too heavy for me and I found the grip too wide. The grip's pretty good on this. Um, the weight's pretty good. I found my pin just sat on the center so it's not a surprise to me that this is one of the best grips I've ever shot with a hunting bow on any of my reviews because it draws back smooth so my pins on the center straight away and it just sat on the center it didn't wobble around the place so overall it makes a bit of a noise so i think that would require a bit of 
playing around with stuff um, on the Uniter. Now, with the Uniter of years gone by, back in the 1990s, and I can't talk about this one because I haven't played around with it. But back in the days gone by, we, we use puffs on the string, which are woolen puffs. We place them around here. We use brush deflectors there. We put felt down on the inside of the limb there. Now, I think off memory, what we also shot was a Dacron string, which was pretty interesting. We'd reinforced the limb tips, and I think we found the Dacron string quieter in, in noise. Um, I know we got them a lot quieter than they got them out of the factory. We did put silences on here. I don't think this was ever the no ever the area where noise was created from the Uniter. I always thought it was this string whacking on this. Um, they've got little bumps now on the limbs. Um, but as a bow, like now as a bow fishing bow, a Niter are pushing these as a bow fishing bow. Awesome bow fishing bow. Price price point obviously too high for bow fishing unless you've got money. But if you want the ultimate bow fishing bow, now if you're shooting big bow fish, bow fish, if you're bow fishing for big fish, and they do in the US, this is cool. And this would be my first pick for a bow fishing bow. In fact, this would be the only bow I'd select for bow fishing because this is the coolest, hardest hitting, the fingers, it's it's the only bow. Um, now, there are other bows for, for finger fish shooting. Hoyt produced the Tribute. Uh, Tribute, I think it's called. Um, look it up. It's got round wheels, very old technology. <sighs> like a pretty boring bow. This is cool. This is a cool bow to shoot. And in 10 years, this is still going to be a cool bow. Um, and you're still going to be happy you brought it in 10 years' time. So even though it's $2,000. Now, price point. This is expensive compared to other compound bows. Um, you know, the PSE Carbon Air, $2,000. The top of the range, top of the range Hoyts are $2,000. Now, back in 1990s, this bow used to sell for $800. Now, the house down the street from me sold for $50,000 in 1990. Today, the house would be worth $450,000, so nine times the price. So if I brought the house back in 1990, the house is nine times the price. So that puts the Oneida nine times eight, $7,200. In real terms, that's how cheap this bow is. Because what's happened is housing prices have gone through the roof. Wages have gone through the roof. Um, I mean, my wage in, in 1990, when I was a public servant, was 20,000, 22, 23,000. When I left the public service, my wage was 125, and today it would be about $170,000. If I was in private enterprise, my wage would be about $300,000. Um, and you're going to ask me, what's my degree? My degree is computer science. I'm, I'm a computer science person who did hospitals for a lot of years. That's basically what I'd be worth, what I should be worth on the market. Um, but I've spent quite a few years since I've been in the private enterprise or in the public service because I've been running the archery shop. But that's what wages are today. So in real terms, even though this bow is two thousand dollars, in real terms, in real terms, as far as I'm concerned, this is really cheap. Um, back in the 1990s, I used to earn twenty dollars a week working at Woolworths. So the bow was $800, it used to take me basically a long time, almost a year to pay off a bow, um, to buy a bow. Today, if you worked in my archery shop for, and you're casual, you'd buy this bow in two weeks. Um, two weeks work, I couldn't build this bow in two weeks. Um, so to me, even though it's 2000, people go, oh, that's expensive, not in real terms not in real terms compared to cost of housing and compared to wages. Um, yes, there's cheaper bows on the market, the PSE Stinger's 500, but this is not a PSE Stinger, this is a machine riser bow, and it's unique. And this bow is more expensive to make than a normal compound bow with this system. So, yeah, overall, so the rest of this test, what I wanna do is I wanna shoot this bow at 50 meters, um, and see what the groupings like. I want to shoot it with fingers and see how well I shoot with it with fingers, see how much finger pinch I get. 
um, and I want to put it through a chronograph. It was actually too dark today to put it through a chronograph. The chronograph wouldn't work because the light conditions are too low. So that's where we're up to. So I'm going to do this two-part, three-part review. Um, I really like the bow and I'm going to show you the different colours it comes in in the further reviews I do. Um, so I'm Stephen Hand from Archery Supplies. The Oneida Phoenix for 2017. Oneida do have two other bows in their range. The Kestrel has been dropped. So it's only why stocks laughed. I think this bow is better than the Kestrel, which is why I didn't bring a Kestrel in. The other one is the Osprey. And that was a cheaper model. Um, and I didn't bother because the price point was not that much lower than this bow. Um, and this bow was clearly superior, in my opinion. So if you get a chance, get into a shop, have a shot with it. Um, Archery supplies, you're always welcome to come in and shoot a bow, try it out. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty nice bow to shoot. Thank you. Have a good time um, and enjoy shooting. So basics of life. Enjoy, enjoy it and enjoy shooting and enjoy what you're doing. Thank you. Bye.